Thank you very much, Terry, and good evening to you all, and welcome to tonight's ICEP lecture series. As I have introduced this series of speakers over the past 10 years, I've been amazed at the breadth of experience and the variety of disciplines that our speakers are involved in, and tonight is really no exception. Dr. George Bullarero is an engineer and educator with a broad background ranging from fluid mechanics to computer languages, biomedical engineering, and science policy. He holds a Doctor of Science degree in engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and has several other honorary degrees. He is the Chancellor of Polytechnic University, of which he was president for more than 20 years. Bullarello has been honored by the Engineering News Record as one of, quote, those who made marks in the construction industry for his part in the creation of Metrotech, the nation's largest urban university industry park. Also, he has chaired and served on the board of a variety of prestigious organizations in the science community. His work has taken him around the world. Bullarello has re re renewed, reviewed I'm sorry, science policy in several countries and has worked as a specialist for the U.S. Department of State in Venezuela and Central Africa. He's held a NATO senior faculty fellowship at the Technical University of Berlin and other assignments have taken him to Egypt and to Venice. Tonight, we're delighted to have him here in Portland to discuss biology, machines, and society, designing the future of our species. Please give, give a warm Portland welcome to Dr. George Bullarello. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, i very kind and warm welcome. I cannot see you because the lights are shining in my eyes, but I can, he I can hear you, and I'm grateful really for your, uh, for your welcome. Uh, this is the first time that my wife and I have been in Portland and uh, in this part of Oregon, and we're absolutely delighted of what we have seen, and we're enjoying tremendously your hospitality, your very warm hospitality. This is really a true discovery for us. What uh, I would like to talk to you about tonight is about, uh, let's see whether it is worse. I hope you can see it. I cannot see it. Can you see it? I hope you can. About biology, machines, and society, designing the future of our species. An ambitious title, but uh, something that uh, I think we need to be concerned about, what is happening to us because of this interaction between biology among biology, society, and machines. Let me define, first of all, what I mean by machine. Uh, machine really means artifact, means something constructed, built, created by, by, by living organism. The, the word machine comes from the Greek mechane, and I prefer the word machine to the word artifact for the simple reason that in Greek, it really, in ancient Greek, it had two meanings. On the one hand, indeed, the meaning of artifact. But on the other hand, it had also a more, a more, a more pejorative meaning, the meaning of devious device from which the word machination comes. And today we are so concerned about technology, not only the good effects, but also the, the, the side effects that we may have or the negative effects that we may have, that I feel it's more appropriate to talk about machines rather than artifacts that have only a simple connotation. An example of our ambivalence is a recent book of why things bite back, technology and the revenge of unintended consequences. So this is why I, I like to use the, the term machine, because it really allows also for this kind of thoughts. Well, let me start from the very beginning. And the very beginning, of course, is the formation of the universe. We believe that the universe uh, started about 15 billion years ago, we're still debating the Big Bang whether, and whether the universe is now expanding or contracting or what. But uh, closer to us, about five billion years ago, the Earth came into being, five billion years ago. Then the first life occurred about uh, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3.7 3, 3 billion years ago. And then a little bit less than two billion years ago, the eukaryotes. And these were really the fusion of a bacteria and a cell 
and made possible the creation of cellular organisms, of multicellular organisms. Then about a billion years ago came se sexual reproduction, approximately. It's very hard really to define exactly when it happened. But we know with uh, a fairly good amount of certainty that about 500 million years ago, a little bit less than that, uh, life, <coughs> excuse me, life form exploded from unicellular algae that developed a large number of algae, many, many other life forms came into being. It was truly an explosion, what we call the Cambrian explosion. And then on this scale, only today, at the year zero, if you like, the humans came into being and with the humans came a machine explosion. This is... Uh, to show, of course, that it didn't happen immediately. It happened on a different time scale, on a much, uh, on a much narrower time scale. Uh, about 40 million years ago, after the phases of development of the brain, of the hardware and the software of the brain, about 40 million years ago, modern humans came into being. Uh, about 30, 35 million years ago, uh, we, we find that, I'm sorry, not 40 million, 40,000 years ago, about, uh, about uh, 40, about 35,000 uh, years ago, we begin to see the first flourishing of art, cave art, in Europe. Uh, the first textile, textiles occurred about uh, 20, 26, 27,000 years ago. Uh, ceramics with them, polystones, rings. The end of the Ice Age was about 12,000 years ago, and with that was the beginning of the population explosion. We believe that at that point the human population was very small. The first domesticated plants and animals occurred about 10,000 years ago. The first cities, 8,000 years ago. The first schools, uh, about uh, 3,000. 5,000 years ago, the first vehicles uh, about uh, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. So, so there has been a development also that has taken its time, but it has occurred so rapidly that we can truly talk about explosion. And of course, in recent years, we have seen all sorts of very rapid development of machines. We have seen uh, automobiles, we have seen steam engine, we have seen uh, uh, machines going into space, we have seen computers, and so on. We, we, we know that uh, we're living in an explosion of information, and here is, an, is, is how, for instance, the information capacity that we have been able to, to master uh, has been growing. has been growing logarithmically from, uh, from 18, 18, 1890 until, uh, until virtually 19, 1980, and now beyond that, with optical fiber, has grown more than logarithmically, so has, has grown at an incre incredible speed. So we can really talk about not only a human human explosion, the explosion of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the creation of modern humans, but also the explosion of machines. However, humans are not the only ones uh, to use machines. Even simple, uni some simple unicellular organisms, like amoebas, uh, cover themselves, have machines, simple machines. It has been found that some amoebas cover themselves with grain, with, with uh, grains of sand to protect themselves. A very rudimentary machine, but a machine it is. Of course, we know the insects that have their, their own artifacts. We know birds that have their own nests. We know beavers that create really very sophisticated lodges and dams. And we know the chimps use uh, sticks uh, to poke and uh, and, and, and to do things with, with the sticks. And then came the humans. So we are not the only one to use machines, but truly the major rapid development of machines, the sophisticated development of machines, of course, occurred with us humans. Uh, this is an anachronistic uh, picture of early humans because actually it's a, it's a picture of relatively recent humans, but it shows the essential characteristic of humans that have distinguished us from uh, from, uh, from the simian ancestors from which we have evolved. Uh, like those simian ancestors, like uh, the apes from which we have evolved, there was a sense of society. You see groups of people working cooperatively. And also, with, like the chimps that I mentioned before, you see some, some artifacts, you see the stick. But uh, our earlier ancestors, it is believed, went beyond the sticks almost from the very beginning. They developed apparently clothing. 
and uh, clothing was important uh, because it was created, according to some theories, for the purpose of enabling our ancestors, as they were moving away from their ancestral, ancestral forests, to carry some food over the increasingly long distances uh, over which they were walking. So you have some machines uh, more sophisticated than those of, uh, of the chimps and other simian ancestors. And you had also a change in biology of our ancestors that made their walking long distances possible. There were at least two factors that were involved. One was the development of a toe that uh, was more apt to walking. In the picture there, you have from the left to the right the, the, the foot of the gibbon, the foot of the orangutan, the foot of the chimp, the foot of the gorilla that begins to approach ours, and then the foot of man. And that, apparently that position of the, undoubtedly, that position of the toe enabled our ancestors to walk more effectively. It is also believed that there was a change in the configuration of the knee. So effectively, from, from the moment in which we emerged from the forest, there has been an indissoluble bond between, between biological evolution, machine evolutions, and society that uh, made us what we are. And because of this bond, and because the evolving complexity of each one of these components, the, evolve, the evolving complexity of our brain, the evolving complexity of our machines, the evolving complexity really of our social bonds, we have been able, we modern humans, have been able to colonize the globe. And this is something that you may... Oh, you may or may not be able to to see perhaps very precisely, but in fact, it shows the path of modern humans, labeled as humans that emerged perhaps 200,000 years ago from Africa over the rest of the globe. And of course, it was a rapid, relatively rapid, very rapid in, in terms of geological time migration, and a migration that was made possible by this, by this bond of, uh, of uh, us with machines and society. So, really, our reality is this combination of biology, society, and machines. And I shall use this term, biosomas, in order to avoid really repeating this longer, uh, longer litany, biology, society, and machines. I'll only use the initials of each one of these uh, three components of so biosoma, bio for biology, so for society, and math for machines. And it is this indissoluble combination, combination increasingly indissoluble combination of biological organisms, society, and machines, which is our reality today that brings us together here today, that makes it possible for us to be here today, that makes cities possible. A city is really an incredibly complex combination of biology, society, and machines that makes agriculture possible because agriculture requires instruments, requires social organizations, require, requires uh, human beings, and of course it also uses other biological organisms. A hospital is a very complex combination indeed, again, of, of living organisms, of, uh, of a social organization specialized for the purpose of healing and of uh, machines of increasingly complex machines, and so on. Just to, just to fix in our mind some representation that, uh, that uh, in a synthetic way gives us a sense of how, how we can think of the biosoma, we can think of ourselves, the best biological organism, being at the center of this uh, biosoma, of this indissoluble combination of society and machines. But we are surrounded by societal organization, by societal entity, by entities, by societal activities, and we are surrounded by machines. And uh, this complex of us with our social connections to our machines interacts also with the environment and it is shaped by the environment. Uh, the biosoma has been constantly evolving from the moment in which, indeed, we emerged from the forest. And we can, if we, if we like to, to imitate what uh, historians do, uh, we, we, may want, we, may, we, can, we can begin, we can attempt really perhaps to label some phases of this development. Let's say that uh, more than three billion years ago, 
really the before really our emergence from the forest, it, we can talk about the pre-biosoma, in which really the interaction of living organisms of our ancestors was purely social. They didn't have many machines. They may have had some machines, but really the essence was primarily a biosocial interaction. Then with our emergence from the forest, and increasingly as we moved away from, uh, from that uh, from that event, until 10,000 years ago, uh, we can talk of perhaps of a primeval, primeval biosoma, in which there was still concurrent evolution of each one of those three components. The biological organism evolved, as I indicated, the toes evolved, the brain evolved, the society evolved uh, to a very considerable extent because of the development of language, and machine evolves. Tools became increasingly sophisticated, increasingly complex. So the primeval biosoma that ended perhaps about 10,000 years ago was a period really of concurrent evolution. All the three components of the biosoma were evolving. From about 10,000 years ago to about 500 years ago, we can talk about the all biosoma, the paleobiosoma, in which the machine now became the social enabler. The machine made it possible agriculture, the machine made, made possible cities, the machine made possible uh, more sophisticated forms of government, the machine really through writing made possible communications, the creation of papers and, and the communication at a distance among, among humans. 500 years ago, really with the, with the invention of printing, uh, to about 55 years ago, uh, we can call that period the period of the mesobiosoma, in which the machine, uh, which of course continue its function of social enabler and continue to evolve, and society of course continue to evolve, but the machine became a social leveler. Uh, printing really created social leveling. People, every person can, could, uh, could uh, attempt to, to find by himself or herself uh, the truths of the things that they were seeking. Uh, uh, Gunpowder that was all that had been developed a little before, 500 years ago, but that came strongly into being with uh, with uh, fire weapons in that period, uh, became a leveler. It really destroyed the aristocratic feudal society. Uh, steam later, of course, also became a different kind of leveler and created an industrialization that again changed the advantages that people that nations had with territory and so on. 55,000 years, 55 years ago, of course, a major event occurred the explosion of nuclear weapons, and we can say that from that moment on, the contemporary biosoma occurred. A biosoma in which our life became really shaped by a balance, and is shaped by a balance between, on the one hand, the triumph, the triumph of the great new things that we have been able to achieve in this 55, in this, within this 55-year period, including the ability to escape the Earth, and on the other hand, the tragedy, the, which uh, has uh, occurred in some instances, but which is ever present in our minds, the possibility really that now, thanks to the development of machines like nuclear weapons, uh, life diversity on Earth can be destroyed, and also thanks simply to the very rapid development of human settlements, life diversity can be destroyed. Now, to talk of biology, society, and machines, of course, is to talk to three immense fields. Sometimes we would like to put a little bit more, more detail on those fields, and one way to do it is perhaps to find some themes that recur uh, across these three fields of biology, society, and machines. And one possible way of looking at it, but there are, anyone can devise, devise uh, his or her own way of looking at biology and society and machines and attempt to find commonalities, themes that uh, enable to relate one component to the other. Uh, a possible set of themes is by, to look at these, uh, these three components of the biosoma in terms of materials, in terms of energy, in terms of information. For instance, we can talk of, uh, of uh, biological materials, uh, we can talk of, uh, of uh, machine energy like steam, we can talk of biological information like the genes of our brain. And if we look at the development of our society, we can see that, uh, that uh, this, the, the center of gravity of our society has changed uh, within the framework of these themes. 
in the pre-industrial society, really what the domina dominating factor was materials. The, the, one of the epitome of the emphasis on materials were the pyramids of Egypt, really fantastic engineering masterpieces, but they depended on the mastery of materials. There was very little energy available other than biological energy, the energy that humans could, uh, could develop or animals could develop. Uh, there were some, some, uh, some machine materials, pottery, metals, but uh, they were limited ultimately. In the, industrial, with the, in, the, in the industrial society, with the industrial revolution, of course, the emphasis shifted to, uh, to, to energy, to machine energy, as you see with, uh, indicated by the lighter gray area. Not that the other areas were not covered. Of course, uh, materials continue to evolve and so on, but really the, the, the dominating theme of society was the ability to produce energy, large amount of energies. Today, we're talking about an information society, and the emphasis is really on information, as the diagram on the left, at the bottom left. And indeed, we are, we, we, computers are about information, telecommunications are about the transformation of, uh, transmission of information, and this will be really uh, on, the, on, the right, uh, on the right side. In, uh, in terms of biology, today the main emphasis is on genes and again on the brain. In terms so society itself, we're talking really of the information society, society shaped by information. So there has been a trajectory here that, uh, that uh, is simply what it is. That's what has been happening, what I call the biosoma circle. We move from the upper left, we moved all the way down to the bottom. Now, clearly, as we see from this kind of, uh, this kind of diagrams, uh, the evolution of the components of the biosoma and the relative emphasis of one component of the biosoma the, over the other shapes our lives. And indeed, the biosoma as a whole shapes our lives and determines our future. Our future will depend on how this, uh, this interaction among biology, society, machines, among our lives, uh, our social organizations, uh, the instruments, the artifacts that we have uh, will play. Uh, clearly, we can begin by saying that uh, biological organisms gave, gave birth to machines. If you go back to my first diagram of the time sequence of development, uh, the Earth and, uh, and uh, unicellular organisms and so on, uh, etc., uh, clearly at a certain point the machine toward the end of the first diagram came, to, came into being. It really represents a new genesis. It represents a new genesis not only because something new has been created, something new and important was created with the, cre with, with the machines, particularly with our very sophisticated machines, but also because we see now the possibility of going beyond or taking one first, further step whereby the machine itself gives birth to other machines, the self-reproduction by machines. We are not there yet. We, we begin to see uh, glimmers of that possibility, but it is indeed truly a new genesis, and genesis still in, in, in the process of being actuated. We can say that every component of the biosoma affects every other component of the biosoma. Thus, machines affect biology. For instance, uh, Pills, which are a simple artifact, not simple, but they are small artifact typically, affect our biology. Genetic engineering, which is really a machine-like intervention on our body, clearly affects our biology. Shelter affects our biology because of, uh, because of our ability to shelter ourselves better and better from, from the elements. Uh, we have been able to expand human, our occupancy of regions of the earth. Conversely, uh, machines also affect society, and society affects machines, and uh, I, will, I will talk about this in a moment. In turn, biology affects society. Uh, clearly, the genes affect, and, and we believe more and more, the genes affect the nature of society. There is a great deal of debate about that, how that occurs, and whether that is the exclusive mechanism, and I don't believe it is, but nevertheless, clearly, uh, biology affects society, and uh, clearly, society affects biology. We see, for instance, that in the case of birth control in China, for instance, has been social pressures that have affected, really, the reproductive, the reproductive developments of of, uh, that society. And the biosoma as a whole affects the environment as we are seeing more and more with ozone holes, carbon dioxide, with the disappearance of species, and in turn, environment affects the biosoma. 
as we see with the differential developments of societies in different continents under different conditions. Let me emphasize or just uh, exempli exemplify the influence of machines on society by uh, recollecting some of the social revolutions, the societal revolution that have been caused with machines. We can start by thinking about, uh, about fire. Let me hold it today. We can think about fire, and fire, of course, led to cooking, led to heating, led to manufacturing, and gave us a wider range of nutrition and shelter opportunities and gave us new products. We can think of agriculture, which gave us uh, uh, different food supply and ample food supply to the point that in this country, for instance, and in other developing nations, the percentage of the population involved in providing food for the rest of the population is very, very small indeed. We can think of writing, and we already talked about the revolution that writing has in introduced, and printing, the reformation, and so on. To move to more modern times, uh, some other examples of societal revolution caused by machines. Scientific navigation, this navigation that was developed uh, uh, primarily by the school of Prince Henry the Navigator in Portugal in the second half of the 15th century, that was really the prime mechanism, the prime, the prime instrument for the discoveries that uh, brought us ultimately all, all of us here. The printing press created books and led to, as we said, to the diffusion and democratization of knowledge. The steam engine led to factories, uh, the industrial revolution, but also it led to warfare and it made possible railroads that have developed this continent. The ability to purify water and to, 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 to treat wastewater has improved enormously urban water supplies and has been, to, to a large extent, responsible for the very rapid increase in life expectancy in this center and for the population explosion. Electricity has changed, of course, our living and work habits and our, has made us at the same time dependent on networks. The internal combustion engine, I don't need to emphasize the impact that it has had on cities. It has made possible the creation of suburbs. It has also, of course, participated in making warfare today what it is, and so on and so forth. But not only machines, as I have said, influence society, society also influences machines. So the significant changes in society affect the way in which machines are produced, are operated and maintained. Uh, for instance, it affects the way in which machines are produced in a market economy versus a centralized economy. And we have seen how different the system is uh, by looking at what happened to the former Soviet Union, in which uh, the change of system for the centralized system that they had to now to the market-oriented system that they must have in order to participate more effectively in the world economy has really affected their technology. Certainly, their technology is, by and large, not easily adaptable to market conditions. Uh, also, different societies have different risks in, the, in terms of how machines are operated. We have seen this at the beginning of the space program. The Russians were able and willing to take risks that we were not able or willing to take, and they had severe losses. We've seen it even today with the space station, in which uh, they have extended the useful life, the, the, the life of the space station beyond what uh, we would really have been inclined to, to accept. But, of course, we had no choice, apparently at this point, to, but to, to to, to continue to go to their, to use their space station. Uh, significant changes in society affect the way in which uh, machines are maintained. Rome, the Roman Empire, about 2,000 years ago, had a fantastic system of roads, roads that made it possible to go from Rome to London in, uh, in, uh, in perhaps less than two weeks. Uh, as the Roman society decayed, as the Roman Empire disappeared, the the road, the, roadway, the road system also decayed. It, uh, it became fragmented and it became impossible to go that fast from Rome to London. In the Middle Ages, it took several months to go from Rome to London. In Haiti, another example, Haiti that was, uh, that was uh, a French colony until a little bit over 200 years ago, had developed under the French a very, a very, a very, a very, a very effective system of canals for irrigation. When the French pulled away and a new society came into being, a new organization, those canals decayed and contributed to the current poverty of Haiti. Uh, today we are very concerned about nuclear waste. The, 
how do we store storage, high level nuclear waste. And one of the problems, and perhaps the fundamental problems, is that this high level nuclear waste has a very long uh, uh, life uh, or half life. And uh, we really cannot be sure that, uh, as a we can be very little sure that uh, we can be sure almost that it's not the case that society, our society, will last hundreds of thousands of years to maintain, really, to safeguard those, those wastes. Because how can we be sure that society will last that long, a societal organization, when all our history thus far tells us that this is not the case? I think we can hope if we rethink our society, as I hope I will be able to discuss. But nevertheless, this is at the core of, at one of, the, at the core of one of our major concerns. Then to make major changes in society, again, affect machines. The French Revolution led to a democratization of society, and this eventually enhanced the production of machines. France was very, very advanced in the 1800s technologically. Of course, it continues to be an advanced country. Now, there are some interesting and important factors that need to be understood in looking at the interaction of society with machines. Let's look at the, the simple diagram on the left in which we have new versus old, and at the bottom, machines versus social framework, society. What happens typically, often, is that new machines, new technologies introduced, but society and the social framework within which the technology operates remains old. And it takes quite some time before, before a new social framework is, uh, is created to, to really correspond to the novelty of the machines. Uh, Often, really, some of the most dramatic examples of uh, biosoma interactions occur in the military field. Uh, let's take, for example, what happened in France in, in the spring of 1940. Uh, the French army had developed some, uh, some very sophisticated tanks, and they had more tanks than the German army. The German tanks were fewer in numbers and were less sophisticated, less, uh, if you like, uh, less capable than the French tanks. However, the Germans recognized that uh, the tank was a new ma machine, a new weapon, and it required a new social organization. And so they organized the tanks in a new kind of military organization, the Panzer Division, the Armor Division. And with these fewer tanks of inferior technical characteristics, they were able to defeat the French. The same occurs today, if you think in terms of genes. We know now that we can begin to diagnose genetically a number of diseases. Uh, we can begin also perhaps to intervene genetically in a number of diseases. Uh, we have a hope that we can do so fairly soon. But the social framework is not adapted to this. Our insurance practices, for instance, uh, have not adapted to this really sea change in, in how we diagnose and treat disease. Likewise, you could say that uh, the converse is also true, that at times new social changes occur, but the machines remain old, as it, I'm showing on the right uh, diagram. And this is indeed the case with, uh, with the technology of the former Soviet Union, a new form of government, a not centralized form of government that has, uh, that, uh, that, uh, has not been able to produce the new kind of machines that are necessary for that government and that society to participate in the global in the global in the global market. Unfortunately, today there is a disconnect uh, between the reality of the biosoma and uh, our ability to understand and shape the biosoma. There is a disconnect among the components of the biosoma, the disconnect, for instance, between the machines and biology, uh, disconnect, as we have seen, between, between machines and society, and also disconnect uh, between the biosoma as a whole and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and really our ability to change our society. There are all sorts of examples of disconnect, uh, whether we wait too long in, fi in, in line, whether we pick up a telephone and we find that, uh, that uh, we have only an automatic answer to us with uh, trees of decision and the tree of decision does not uh, satisfy our needs and there is no way that we can get hold of a human operator. And we have, all of us, I'm sure, can find and examples of these disconnects. And the disconnect also has global dimensions. 
An example of this connect is well portrayed by a cartoon by George Rauch. It's an old cartoon of 1974 that says really the world is not in balance. There is, uh, there is a relative minority of people that have more influence on the world than the large majority that uh, is on the right. And when there are imbalances, there are instabilities. Where, where there are instabilities, there are grave dangers. Uh, for example, many people in the world today uh, still don't, uh, don't, have never made a phone call. So how can they benefit from the great advances in the internet, in telecommunications, if, have, if they have no way of having access? AT&T has developed uh, around Africa a very powerful network of optical fibers, which uh, then will lead into different regions of Africa. And that, of course, uh, will greatly increase the capability of communicating with Africa. But the problem is that many people in Africa don't have the, the capability, the financial means, the social organization to access that network, admirable as it is. It will happen, but that at this moment is a disconnect. We can only address these problems of disconnect, this problem of imbalances, by seeking integration. And the search for integration in, in its many manifestations is really a very old one. Already Socrates uh, was very concerned about that, and, uh, and this is what he said. How was it possible for the artisans and artists of his time to have developed such impressive knowledge of their trade while similar competence was lacking in the political domain? In other words, you saw a great deal of great advances in Athens, the Parthenon, uh, uh, all sorts of other advances, the Admirable, the Agora, etc., uh, ships that were built rapidly, harbors and all that, and yet he found a disconnect between his ability to build those, those technical advances and the ability really to develop a more intelligent political system. And of course, that was the end of Athens. Shortly thereafter, Athens disappeared as a significant power. So we need to integrate knowledge. First of all, of course, we need to integrate within the biosoma. We need to integrate society, biology and machines, if you like. The, we need to integrate society with the human made, with biology. And today we're far away from really having that integration. It suffice to think of our curricula in the university. Uh, st students who study biology do not even look at machines. And yet machines are really the extension of biology by other means. Students who study engineering, that is, they study machines and how to design machines, broadly speaking, do not look very much at biology. There are only perhaps two or three universities in the country at this moment that require of all the engineering students that they look at biology. There is more interaction between, between certain elements of society and machines, but even there, not very much. There is, uh, uh, and I will, I will go back to that. A second kind of integration, which is really essentially the same kind of integration, only presented in different way, is integration between the our efforts to understand nature, the whys of nature, which is science, our efforts to modify nature, and the question there is how do I modify nature, that is engineering in a broad sense, including medicine, because medicine, like engineering, does not accept nature as it is, does not accept disease, which is a natural phenomenon, but tries really to fight it, to modify nature, therefore. And the interaction with, the, uh, with what can be called the humanities, the disciplines that really ask the question, should we, including philosophy and ethics. That integration is very, very limited today. There is some integration between science and engineering, some aspects science and engineering, broadly speaking, therefore science and what we traditionally call engineering, science and medicine, there we see some integration. Uh, uh, very little integration between engineering and humanities, indeed between me medicine and humanities. So this is a serious problem. But as I said, it is an old problem, so there has been historically a long series of attempts to integrate, and I hope maybe you can see those, but really there again those two triangles on the top, on the left, uh, humanity, science and engineering, broadly defined as I have done it, and on the right, biology, society and machines. Aristotle, for instance, uh, was, uh, uh, was attempting to integrate physics and the humanities, what he called metaphysics, or at least one aspect of the humanities, namely philosophy. Thomas Aquinas was uh, the great, well, provided a great attempt of integration, he attempted to integrate science and religion, 
again, if you like, science and one aspect of, uh, of, uh, of humanities. Uh, the humanist, I'm sorry, the humanist, uh, uh, of course, uh, were successful in integrating to a very considerable extent science and the humanities in the Renaissance. And also, they were interested and capable of doing some integration of biology and machines. So that was an interesting moment of integration. Leonardo, and as an example of that period, he also worked at the integration of science with machines. And by the way, a uh, machine is not only the artifact, the utilitarian artifact, but if you define machine as anything created by human beings, art is also a machine, although of a different kind of machine. But certainly it is, it is a machine in, the, in terms of the definition. Leonardo also uh, attempted to integrate and successfully integrate biology and machines. His studies of anatomy reflected his knowledge of machines. Uh, his knowledge of machines made it possible for him to understand better the human being. Currently, there are several efforts in this direction that are still limited and episodical. There is an effort that really has a name, the technology and society studies, that attempt to integrate humanities and, uh, and engineering. There is uh, an attempt in the last triangle below that uh, to integrate science and society. And there are science and society studies. They conduct uh, a, very, a very difficult existence in our universities today. Bioengineering has been much more successful if we look to the triangle on the right, uh, the integration of biology and engineering, but has been limited. It's been limited to the departments of bioengineering. Biology is not viewed really as central to engineering. And then social biology, as I mentioned, the uh, the attempt to look at how uh, biology influences society more actually rather than the reverse. And, uh, and then lastly, very recently, Professor E.O. Wilson of Harvard has been talking of consilience as another form of integration. And this is how Professor Wilson sees integration. He sees the integration of environmental policy, policy ethics, biology, and social sciences at different levels of, uh, different level of intensity. And this is a, a, good, a very good effort. However, if you were to analyze the attempt of integration in terms of our triangle, you could say that environmental policy, ethics, and social sciences really represents the so, as the, so the social aspect, the societal aspect at the top of the triangle on the left. And then, of course, biology represents biology at the bottom on the left of the triangle on the left. So he leaves open the question of machines in whichever way you want to, to, to cast, uh, to cast the, the framework of Professor Wilson, he does not consider machines. But yet, it is my contention that understanding the biosoma is key to integration. So to understand the biosoma, we must understand the components of the biosoma. I think we understand uh, fairly well, to, within the limits, of course, of our current, uh, current, uh, current science, uh, what biological organisms are, and we have made major, major efforts at understanding, at understanding society. Uh, we know how to build machines. We know how to build machines of increasing sophistication and capacities, marvelous machines, but we really do not understand quite well, really, what a machine represents. And so let me attempt to deal with these aspects here. What characterizes biological organisms, of course, is they all come, stem from a single ancestor. And from the single ancestor, at the, this is just one small element of the, of the biological tree, but from a single ancestor, then they all, all the different life forms have evolved. For a machine, it's quite different. For the biological organisms can be collected, uh, can be brought back to the single ancestor, to this original cell, or even before the, the original cell, maybe to an original fragment of DNA, or even before that, to pre-DNA. Certainly, this is not the case with machine. No way that this podium is related in any way to that lamp. They're different. I can create, of course, a tree of, uh, of derivations by, by, by looking at podiums and different kinds of podiums, different evolution of podiums. I can do the same with lamps, starting with Edison lamps and uh, uh, other kinds of lamps that we have today. But no way that one comes from the other or that they have a common ancestor. The only thing that they have in common is the mind of the designer. The agent for evolution of the biological organism, what has made it possible to go from that single initial 
organisms, to the immense variety of biological organisms that we have today or that have existed, is really the genes. The genes. On the other hand, what uh, makes possible the evolution, if you like to call it that way, of machines is really design. And, and so there is a profound difference. I mentioned that, uh, that art is also a machine, that a piece of art, a machine, a painting, a sculpture is a machine. There is, however, a difference which is, uh, I believe, significant between, between a conventional machine and art. It's significant in terms of, of the potential relationship between the two. A conventional machine, take an engine, or take a lamp, has a definite performance. Uh, I design it in such a way that I get out of the machine what I intended to give it, that it should give me. Very different is the case with art. I'm an artist, I paint a painting, but I never know how you will interpret my painting. So the, the, the conventional machine, the engine, the lamp, can be called the definite performance machine. The performance is definite. A piece of art is, in, of indef is a machine, by my definition, but has an indefinite performance because uh, no matter what I do, I as a creator of the piece of art can never know what will be the reaction, the perception of those who view it or use it. A biological organism is also a semi-definite performance entity. It's also an, an entity, but it has a semi-definite performance entity. It has a semi-definite performance entity because more and more we can understand how a biological organism reacts to inputs. And we can quantify some of those inputs with a certain, with a certain degree of certainty, but not all of the inputs. While uh, we, we can know what happens when we inject uh, uh, nitrate in, uh, in, 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 in a body, what are the reactions of the heart, when, if we can know what, what happens when we inject certain medicine in a body and we can really be relatively sure of what happens, certainly we have a great deal of difficulty in understanding the reactions of the brain to an external stimulus. So I call that a semi-definite performance entity, almost between the machine, which is a Definite, the conventional machine, which is a definite performance entity, and, the, and, the, and a piece of art which is uh, totally unspecifiable in terms of its performance. Society, societal entities, societal processes are very similar to biological organisms in this sense, also have semi-definite performance. Sociologists can perhaps uh, chart certain reactions of certain social organizations uh, under certain conditions, but can never totally predict it. If those things were totally predictable, all elections would be predictable and our social life, our political life would be different. Uh, let me continue by focusing on the machines because they are the element of this triad of biology, society, and machines. They need to be understood much more. We can look at machines in many ways. There are all sorts of machines of immense complexity. But one way that is, as an example, a useful way of looking at machines is distinguishing between individual machines and collective machines. Individual machines are machines that we use individually, like a bicycle, often the automobile, a candle in, uh, in the case of energy, uh, hearing aid and eyeglasses in the case of communication, and collective machines are those that are produced and operated by social organizations. For instance, an airplane is not used usually by a single person, a train certainly not, a ship certainly not, a pipeline certainly is used by many, 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 many users. Likewise, a TV station is used by many users, a network is used by many users, a power plant, nuclear energy, those are collective machines. They're produced and operated by social organization. Let me continue this list for a moment. Uh, a newspaper, again, is individual. My watch is individual. I use it. Uh, but on the other hand, a clock, a clock on a, on a town hall, uh, that clock is used by many people. It's a collective machine. Uh, clothing is uh, individual, uh, but the environment, the, in, in, in the environment, the city, an apartment house, uh, those are collective. They're used by many people. Uh, a waste uh, water treatment plant is a collective machine. In terms of healing, a pill is something individual. I and only I take it, take my pill, but the hospital is a collective machine, and so on. The significance of this is this, that, uh, ah, that you cannot read. Today's individual machines, that's, it says this, that today's individual machines are produced 
almost totally by collective machines. Even if uh, my watch is my watch, is my individual machine, I cannot build that watch. There's got to be a vast organization that builds that watch. Although my glasses are my glasses, I cannot build those glasses. I need a vast organization to do so. Although my newspaper is my newspaper, I cannot produce it, and, uh, and so on. My clothing is my clothing, but really I cannot do it. Our more distant ancestors, on the other hand, and not even so distant ancestors, had much more control of their individual machines. Not only they use them individually, but also they produce them individually. So today, there is a kind of paradox that while on the one hand, increasingly powerful individual machines like the PC, uh, indeed uh, the automobile, or whatever you like, uh, the, 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 the newspaper, the, the whatever, increasingly powerful individual machines have given us more and more freedom. On the other hand, we are more and more dependent for their production and their maintenance and their operation on, on very large organizations. And we do not quite understand really the consequences of this paradigm shift. It is a significant paradigm shift and it is this paradox of greater freedom and on the other hand greater dependency. But uh, perhaps the most fundamental question about machines is really what does the machine do? And the machine does a number of things. First of all, uh, of course, we all think of the machine as something that extends our biological and societal capabilities. It extends our senses. With the x-rays, I can see through matter. With the television, I can see at a great distance. It extends our muscles with motors, uh, with explosives, you know, the really extremely powerful muscles. Uh, it extends our brain with books and computers. It extends our skin with clothing houses that really increase, the, extend the protection that uh, clothing, house, the clothing extend, uh, houses extend the protection that clothing gives us. You can think of modification of weather that we're beginning to do to some extent and to dream to much greater extent, also is something that extends our skin. So I think we all, in one way or another, think of this as a machine, of course, extending our biological and our social capabilities. But on the other hand, the machine also does a number of other things that are important and we need to recognize in terms of their importance. A machine complements biology and society. For instance, a machine regularizes performance. Think of a pacemaker. You have a heart that doesn't beat regularly. You put a pacemaker in a machine and the heart beats regularly. A pill does the same. It provides, it brings again, it attempts to bring again to regularity a biological organism. The assembly line, unpleasant as a device as it is, but it does regularize the performance of, uh, of the humans working on it because they all have to work at a certain pace. The machine, of course, uh, uh, enhances fights against infection and there is really this constant struggle between infections becoming uh, more resistant to medicine and pills, that is, machines, that is, and, uh, and new pills, new medicine trying to fight uh, that increased resistance. The machine re replaces diseased organs, uh, the, artificial organ, the artificial heart, the artificial kidney, the ball that uh, we put in, in hips to replace worn out, uh, jo uh, worn, worn out joints and so on. So this is a very important function of the machine and a function that becomes increasingly important. The machines modifies biology. It clearly machine modifies our behavior. We are still, in terms of our physiology, by and large, what our ancestors were three million years ago, four million years ago. We're still intrinsically gazers. Grazers. We, we, we really should eat constantly and in small amounts. Instead, society made possible by machines, the modern city in which we are at a great distance from our houses when we work typically forces us to eat in def a definite amount of times and usually to have frequently to have our major meal at night when it is the most, uh, the most inappropriate to have. And machine of course influences our behavior whether we, it changes the way in which we, we, we run to the refrigerator during the intermission, during, during the publicity and on, on television, uh, whether in the, in the 40s or 50s we were, we were making love in the back seat of cars and so on, clearly the machine modifies our behavior. And the machines modify society again. 
we're talking now of telemarketing, a new form of marketing coming very rapidly into being. Uh, a few years ago, three, three, four years ago, we were doing perhaps half a billion dollars of business on the, on the internet. Today we are projecting that, that by, by the year 2002, we'll be doing about $40 billion of business on the internet. But the machine does other things yet. The machine enhances our understanding of biology and society. That also is a very important point and, uh, and, and one that also has a philosophical, a significant philosophical component. A machine is simple because we design the machine intrinsically, so we know what goes into the machine. And because we understand the machines, we're able increasingly to bring that understanding of the machine to the understanding of the biological organism. So, for instance, our, and that started already over 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, our understanding of how a fluid flows through a pipe has made it possible for us to analyze the circulatory system. And the more we understand the, the flow of fluids through more complex pipes, pipes that are flexible, that are variable, etc., the better we understand the circulation. The more we understand the computers because we build them and we have to have a certain logic in building the computers, the more we understand our brain. And in reality, we can say that perhaps we can only understand nature if we build nature. And so what we see today is the chemists, which are science, that are scientists, people that really are interested in understanding nature, in order to understand nature, creating nature. We see the chemists doing synthetic chemistry, creating new, new, new elements, creating, creating new molecules in order to understand the behavior of nature. So this is a very important function of the machine. And perhaps we can only understand the universe if we will be able to build it. The machines also obviously creates new environment. The city is a product of the machines. Uh, uh, the elevators made possible the vertical city, the great difference between, until very recently, between American cities and European cities was that Otis, Mr. Otis, that created the, the first elevators, really was American. Uh, the suburb, the automobile, made possible the suburb. The factory, the steam engine, made possible the factory. Uh, the computer today, to an increasingly large extent, makes possible these very immense uh, offices with uh, very, large, uh, very large floor space occupied all by thousands of people working on computers. The space station, again, is a new environment has been created by machines, and so on. The cornfield, again, created by machines, the regularity of the planting, and so the machines create a new environment. And the last point, of course, is, as I have already indicated in a number of ways, the machine makes us totally dependent on machines. No way that our world of uh, six billion people today, soon perhaps to be eight or ten, uh, could survive without the machine. Now, what does the biosoma offer us? If we understand the biology, society, and machines, and if we are prepared to understand how they interact and how we can uh, guide the interaction, I think what the biosoma opens to us are new vistas. It opens to us new ways of putting things together. It offers to us new trade-offs among these three components. It offers us new synergies. It offers, it offers us truly a new view of biology, of machines and society. And it offers us a new chapter in the evolution of human thought. Let me very briefly, because by now, my God, I've talked a great length. Uh, let, me, let me very briefly talk about some of these points. First of all, the synthesis. For instance, we can think of bringing together definite performance machines and indefinite performance machines, art and conventional machines, if you like, a synthesis of right and left brain. What is the goal? Well, the goal is very simply to enhance individuality. We are all victims of the monotony that mass production creates. It counteracts that monotony. It enhances our individuality. It makes it possible to mass produce individuality. We can bring together biology, biological organisms and machines. And again, we can enhance the range of either, and we can begin to think of conscious machines. We can bring together society machines, which is another synthesis of definite and semi-definite elements. And the goal there is really to have a more humane society. The machines introduces to our society power, speed, economy, reliability, and the social component brings to this synthesis with the machine social purpose, intelligence, flexibility, and humanity. Another set of vistas are the trade-offs. When do we use biology? When do we use society? When do we use machines? 
and uh, all kind of major problems in our society really depend very much on how we solve and whether we're willing and able to intelligently uh, articulate these trade-offs. For instance, war. We have really increasingly the possibility of automating war, of deciding that war should be a war among machines, between machines, rather than, uh, than, than between human beings. Space. There is a great de a debate today. Should we go in space with humans or should we go in space with automated spaceships? And there are all sorts of consequences, including, of course, very major budgetary consequences, because going into space with humans humans is much more costly. Contraception, a very good example. Uh, we can do contraception by biological means, uh, following, if you like, biological rhythms. We can do contraception by social pressure, as it happened in, in India, and above all in China. Uh, uh, we can do contraception by machine devices, the contraceptives. I will skip this because the hour is late, but I'll just uh, show you the picture, and if I had more time, I would spend more time in showing that we can also bring together two synergies of these three components, uh, uh, new things. We can create artificial tissues, we can create new heart assist devices, we can, create, we can utilize new forms of biological energy, we can create intelligent materials, we can think of DNA computers, and so on. In reality, really, because of these possibilities, we can think of a new biology. And the new biology really is metabiology, uh, the continuation of biology outside of the biological organism, in which really we move from the process of evolution to the process of intervention in the biological organism. We can think of new machines, as I said. We can think of engineering as the continuation of biology by other means. And the moment we begin to think about that, we can think also of, uh, of the interaction between the two in a much more powerfully uh, inventive ways. We can think of biomachines, this combination of biology and machines. We can think of machines that imitate many of the fantastic characteristics of the great constructor that nature is and so on. We can think of a new society, a society in which there is a new perception of the human potential. Uh, in terms of machines, we can go all the way from uh, passive machines to machines that are increasingly sophisticated, all the way to the great question, which is not only a biological question, but also a question in the design of machines. Should we build conscious machines? First of all, could we build them? And if we could build them, should we build them? In terms of the, in terms of the new society and the new perception of human potentials, also we must think of new perception of human beings new perception of human needs. And one of these is really to say that every human being ultimately, when, if we recognize how important the synergy is of biology, society, and machines, should have not only a certain biological attributes, should be fed and should be should be, should, be, should, should be kept at, uh, at a temperature where it can survive, should receive water, should receive light, and as we do uh, for prisoners, for instance, today, but also should have a certain amount of social connections that really are in, an inalienable right of any human being and should have a certain amount of machines, uh, should have a certain amount of clothing, certain access to telecommunication. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, a good portion of the world today doesn't have that access, should have certain and access to, to transportation. Let me talk, and I wish I had more time about this, but let me talk briefly again at the last point, the evolution of human thought. In Egypt, really, uh, one could look at ancient Egypt in, 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 in a society that represents perhaps half of the, half of the, of the life of, uh, that, that has spanned about half of, uh, of, uh, of, of human history. We can think of ancient Egypt as a society in which, soci in which society was central, in which the pharaoh, the social component was central, the pharaoh was central, the, religion, the religious uh, hierarchy was central. Ancient Greece it brought, about this, it brought in the concept of the centrality of the human being, the concept that man is the measure of all things, and also a new concept of societal form, the police, the city, and also the concept of balance, that you had to balance the individual with society, and the trial of Socrates was really about that balance between the individual right and the societal right. Rome uh, moved away from the Greek conception and pushed for the centrality of the state. And the Roman state was, in, in, its, uh, in its heyday, was a state in which society, the law, 
was important. The great religions, all the great religions, of course, talk about and are concerned about the centrality of God. So it's really, you have a religious society there that we see today all the way to the Taliban in Afghanistan. In medieval Europe, at the same time, there was the concept of the centrality of the earth. And, uh, and St. Thomas, that I mentioned before, has made the attempt to reconcile, made the attempt to reconcile religion and science. He was not totally successful. In the Renaissance, the, the emphasis shifted again, and the, and the concept was the centrality of man and reason, and also the centrality of the sun with Galileo, and there were all, all sorts of, course, of struggles on that. In the 18th century to the first half of the 20th century, there's been a reappraisal of what biology is. There has been a demolition of the separateness of humans and animals with Darwin and Haeckel. Uh, there, has been a there was a great belief in progress spurred by the French Encyclopedia and then the French Revolution. Then there was the demolition of the belief in pure rationality. Freud did just that. He demolished the belief that humans are purely rational. There was a strong emotional component. But that came World War I and World War II, and, uh, and uh, the belief in progress disappeared. How could you believe in progress where 20, 25 million people died in the most stupid way? Uh, nationalism became exasperated. Uh, the disaster after World War I led to strong totalitarianism. And after World War II, really, we, we, we are now largely in a period in which we talk about two cultures, in which we're very cynic about progress, in which we're very concerned about the environment, in which we're afraid that uh, technology, uh, if you can do it, you will do it. And there's, so you have technologically a deterministic approach, and so on. I think, I believe that uh, the biosoma really can pull us out of these doldrums of the postmodern society, if you like, and it is based on five, on six major concepts. I'm sorry. The first concept is really indeed that biology, society, and machines are indissoluble. This is an indissoluble synthesis, and that has its social consequences, this essential biosoma. The second, that the human can indeed modify themselves. Really, we're going beyond Darwin, we're going beyond Freud. We, we, we don't accept the fact that we're really prey to emo, to, only to emotions, or the emotions dominate us. We can create also, we can modify ourselves by bringing us together more intimately with machines beyond the pacemaker. Of course, we can modify other living organisms. Of course, we can modify the environment. And because we can do those things, also we require a responsibility that uh, our ancestors didn't even imagine. We can escape Earth gravity in a sense we are not wedded anymore to the gravity of Newton. We come beyond that. And we can also connect each other in very powerful ways that I call hyperintelligence that go really way beyond the global village of McLuhan. The fact is that with the biosoma, this biosoma has appeared and this increasingly powerful biosoma that we are involved with today has appeared at about halfway in the, at the halfway point in the existence of the Earth. And if I might go back again to a diagram, let's start this time with the, with the genesis of the Earth five million years ago, the genesis of life, the genesis of society. And right now, we are really in the middle of a life of the Earth that we believe will cease perhaps five billion years from now when the sun may expand and engulf us. We are halfway at this point, and the first half of the history of the Earth, certainly the history of human beings, has been dominated by evolution, and has been dominated by natural selection and speciations, has been dominated by the genes, and, and, and has been dominated by the necessity, our necessity, the necessity of every human being, living organism, to adapt to the environment. Now we're in a period with the biosoma, really we have, uh, we're entering the period in which uh, we cannot talk of evolution, but in quotation marks, and in which evolution is really, this evolution in quotation marks is really not only purely biological, but it's biosocial machine evolutions. The biosoma now dominates for better or for worse, and it depends on us whether it will be for better or for worse. Uh, the environment we can modify. We can go beyond Earth, even if the Earth were to disappear. We see now, and we have experienced that, that we can move outside of Earth. We're not tied to the gravity of the Earth, and we can consciously modify biology. The fact is, and this is, you'll be relieved to know, this is my last uh, slide here, we are really engaged in an, in an 
in a, in a gamble for very high stakes. Uh, we can go either way at this moment. And it will depend really on how we understand the biosoma, how we understand this interaction of biology, society, and machines, whether we'll be able to, to, to go in a favorable direction or we'll be fall victim to the unruly development of one component at the expense of the other. Clearly, longer lifespans, healthier lifespans, control of biology, the ability to be in space, uh, global communications, knowledge, these are all the positive things that the biosoma uh, has brought to us, is bringing us, and makes it possible for us. On the other hand, the other side of the gamble are dangerous. Uh, nuclear explosives are terribly dangerous. Overpopulation is very dangerous. Sperm counts, we, we now have uh, sufficient evidence that they are half what they were at the beginning of the century. This is the famous uh, uh, true story of the scientist that was being queried by a senator about this point. And he told the senator, Senator, you are half of the man that your grandfather was. <laughs> uh, we know that because, because we have provoked this reaction, bacteria and viruses mutate much too fast. We know that we have ozone holes, we have global warming, we have consumerism. And these are the new things that have been brought about also by imbalances in the biosoma to a considerable extent. And then they are all things that have been with us from, from, from the beginning, greed, hatred, aggression, and poverty. But again, to conclude, if we act wisely, we can take uh, uh, advantage of really of the immense opportunities that the Biosoma offers and avoid really the negative factors that, uh, that are there ready to ambush us. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you. You need this. There's two mics here and one mic up there. George, that was awesome uh, lecture. Very kind. I, I apologize again for running so much over time. I just get carried away. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I'm Thank overwhelmed. Um, do you think historians in the future will look back at this century as one in which uh, there was sort of a fundamentalism of science, that, in the same way that you know we view religious fundamentalism, that there's sort of a scientific fundamentalism? Uh, that's a difficult question. I think it's a very difficult question to answer because on the one hand there are scientific fundamentalists, people who focus almost exclusively on science and are so obsessed by the focus on science they don't look at the other aspect of society. On the other hand, this is the period in which science has been one of the most liberating, liberating influences in our lives. So it's a, it's a it's, I don't think it would be looked at really as science fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it may run the danger of being looked at as a scientific determinism. In other words, we can do things, therefore, by all means, let's do them, and let's not reflect enough. But I think the worst, uh, the, the probably the most likely thing, uh, that's my, my prejudice, it will look at us as a society that really has not paid enough attention to the potential of science and technology. And uh, let me go back to the question of World War I. Uh, Gettysburg occurred, of course, in the 1860s, 1860s, and Gettysburg, the child up that hill, was uh, already an indication how it was really absolutely crazy to send human beings against concentrated fire. Uh, at Gettysburg, they didn't have machine guns. Uh, in 1914, on, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Flanders in 1916 in, uh, in the Somme on the on, during World War, World War I and again later in Flanders and at Verden and so on, the generals had forgotten that lesson. Society, if you like, if you consider uh, a military organization, a social organization, had forgotten the lesson of, uh, the lesson of uh, Gettysburg and was unable to extrapolate to the more, even more powerful machines that were available at the time. And as a result was this catastrophe, this human catastrophe. People, the 20, 30, 50,000 people dying in a day being sent against the wall of, uh, of machine gun fire. So I think that was an example of really society because it was not only the generals, who were the politicians behind the generals, were the newspapers behind the politicians behind the generals, uh, they all insisted that, uh, that the victory should be achieved at any cost and, uh, and they really had no sense, no sense of what was so terribly devastating to the human beings, to the biological component. So I think that probably, and we have seen that again and again, of course, World War II was uh, similar in it, 
and uh, other things of that time. So I think really uh, the, 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 the genocides in Africa, again, are examples really of the inability of, uh, of uh, society to, uh, to, to try to use effectively its powers rather than let its destructive powers uh, uh, gain the day. So I believe that probably that's what we look at uh, well, more than anything else. And that was what was really interesting to me was, you know, there's, we have enough food to feed everyone in the world, right. yet we don't. And we, don't. we right. have enough you know, technology to house everyone in the world, and yet we, we cannot. Right. So in some sense, are you suggesting that we need to devote more engineering entrepreneurship to analyzing political structures? You know, we're doing, we're going, we're very fast paced in terms of technology well, and machines, sure. but not in terms of society. But remember Socrates. So Socrates said, you know, you're able to do all these marvelous things, and look how how, how poor is uh, is the political. Uh, the, uh, really, he was talking about the artisans. He was talking about the technologies of the time, primarily. Uh, how how poor is your ability really to operate on the political scene? And I think clearly we do have the technology, but technology per se is not sufficient. The whole of society must understand technology. And yet, if you think of it, uh, we are just beginning to talk about being concerned about science literacies in, in the schools, but we don't even talk about technology literacy. So we're concerned about people understanding the solar system, understanding astronomy, understanding biology, but uh, we're doing really virtually nothing in our schools. The schools that bring up the people that will make the decisions, they will be voters, they will be, they will be, they will be electors, they will be elected. Uh, we do virtually nothing to tell them, well, these are the factors that must be taken into account in making a decision. This is what you can expect by the interaction of technology with society, technology with biology. So that is, I think, the issue which is really of great urgency for us. Hmm. Why don't you go ahead? I cannot see you, but maybe you can. Thank you very much. Um, some have suggested that the collective machines that you speak of uh, may suffer a widespread simultaneous failure just over 11 months from now, the Y2K bug. Um, <laughs> given our dependence on these machines that you pointed out very eloquently, uh, how do you anticipate that the biological and societal components of uh, the biosoma might react, might balance, uh, if this comes to pass? Well, the, 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 I think the problem of the year 2000, of course, is a serious problem. Uh, I think we are perhaps exceedingly concerned about it. Uh, major organizations, as part of the Biosoma, if you like, uh, are really taking steps to, to, to be sure that nothing happens. However, something that will happen, undoubtedly. I don't believe it will be something of a catastrophic nature, indeed, because uh, many of the major organizations have really, uh, are putting lots of effort, lots of money, into trying to address this problem. But problems will arise. Uh, how can they arise? I, I happen to sit on the board of a power company, and the power company has spent a substantial amount of money and effort in seeing to it that all the programs that it has in-house uh, really have been tested so that there is no, uh, there is no likelihood that uh, this problem will be encountered. On the other hand, the company, like any other company, like any other organization, not only produces its own computer programs, its own technology, but also buys technology from other people. And now it must be sure that the other people, the other, the other entities that provide technology, be it PCs, be it uh, uh, meters or what have you, uh, also are compliant. And what uh, one sees that sometimes uh, some of these organizations say, yes, I'm compliant, but then you go and test the particular product that they're giving you, and you find that indeed it is not compliant. So there is an element of uncertainty. But I don't, and I don't believe there will be a catastrophe. Thank you for the question. Thank anyone, you. Is there anyone over here? Nope. Above. Why don't you go ahead then? Uh, do you think that uh, it will be possible? I know this may sound a bit uh, fictitious, but do you think it will be possible someday for uh, biology and machinery to completely merge, as in uh, society perhaps existing in a, in a totally virtual world? Uh, virtual reality, things like that. It, it, I know it's, it's quite far-fetched, but... Uh. Well, I think it will be a long time from now. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the many people, starting with Descartes, have said the biological organ is, is a machine. I have tried to indicate that, at least to me, a biological organ is not a machine because it has this fundamental difference. It is being developed by genes, and the machine is being developed by the mind of the designer. But uh, is it possible? 
conceivably it is possible. Is it desirable? Conceivable in certain cases it is desirable. Uh, if we were to go into space, we would find, uh, substantially into space, we would find that uh, our, our biological system is really not well adapted to space, in spite of Senator Glenn, uh, because, <laughs> because, uh, because we're a liquid system. And, and the space is an environment in which liquid freeze or evaporate, and, uh, and it's a bad environment. It wouldn't be better if we were to be uh, an, an organism that has some of the characteristics of the machines. And it's conceivable, you know, that over the next uh, uh, 10,000 years, we may be able indeed to change some of the fundamental characteristics of our liquid system. So from that viewpoint, it would be desirable. Uh, what we must be sure is that we do not lose our humanity. Because at this moment, really, we are about the survival of our species. That is the essential thing, the essential point of the biosoma. And that's why I drew it with biology at the center and society and machines around it, is really to preserve our humanities. If we can transform ourselves while maintaining our humanity, then uh, conceivably that could occur. Uh, it's technically possible, to some extent it is. Uh, I don't foresee it totally technically possible, but I foresee more combinations of biological organisms and machines. We talk to the pacemaker, and we know that it's possible. People are inserting uh, meshes into the, into the coronaries of the heart, and we know that it's possible. People are inserting, are beginning to think of truly artificial, portable artificial kidneys, that is possible, and so on. So it would be a combination of these things. At the same time, we will grow all Organs, rather than replace them by artificial organs. So it will be a very flexible boundary between biology and machines. And maybe the best direction will be trying to, again, uh, take advantage of the capabilities of either. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to ask a question at the opposite extreme, and, uh, which is Howard Rheingold, who was a speaker in this series a couple of years ago, has a fascinating article in Wired Magazine this month about uh, he spent a week with the Amish in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania worrying about how they decide to adopt certain technologies and and right. not adopt certain technologies. Um, and one of the Amish workshop owners said that, that they're not so worried about losing their religion or becoming people who use lots of technologies, but they fear the, quote, assimilating the far more dangerous idea that progress and new technologies are usually beneficial and that individuality is a precious value. I think, I think they have a very bad point. Well, what I was going to ask you was, you know, they have a pretty strict system for evaluating right. technology. I'm not, I don't think that you're suggesting something that strict, but do they have something there? Yeah, I think, I think their concern is very valid. I think we should all have that concern. What happens to us in interaction with machines? What happens to, to our human values? Do, do we become dehumanized? And we have become dehumanized to a certain extent. Think of the highway rage, the road rage. It's an example of dehumanization. So we have become dehumanized to some extent. On the other hand, the Amish have uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, priceless opportunity for them to be left alone. No one is really declaring war on the Amish. But if you look at history, those nations that, uh, that could not uh, adopt new technologies rapidly enough were submerged. Look what happened on these continents to the Indians. It was in part technology, it was in part disease, uh, the disease made possible by transportation of people rapidly from other continents, not sufficient time to adapt. Uh, look at what happened to, to the Ottoman Empire that was so powerful, it was the, the dread of Europe uh, up to the 1600s, and then it decayed because, because it started looking inward and then decided that certain technology would adopt and other, other, other technology would not ad adopt. And so there is no, look at China. China that was extremely advanced, was far more advanced than Europe in the 1500s, up to the 1500s, uh, it remained fairly static. And uh, in a certain moment, of course, it collapsed. And uh, now it is trying to regain, to regain its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its strength uh, by adopting technology. It simply could not leave technology out. Look at Japan. In 1853, Admiral Perry went to Japan. At the time, Japan was uh, a feudal nation of uh, wooden ships. And uh, that was 1853. And uh, we forced, the West forced uh, the opening of Japan. And Japan uh, could not do what the Amish can do at this point, uh, continue its way of life. And it had to adapt. And it adapted very, very fast to the point that in, in, in uh, 1904, 1905, it defeated the, the Russians. The Russians had built, had 
went with an immense fleet uh, to, to, the rescue, to the rescue of Port Arthur that was being besieged by the Japanese. And the Japanese at the naval battle of Tsushima defeated the Russians with the most modern ships, the most modern optics, the most modern artillery. And in 50 years, they had to regain all the time they had lost by trying to really circumscribe the development of technology. Hmm. The Amish, therefore, <laughs> are, 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 have this luxury of uh, being able to to decide in, within their own environment without, uh, without uh, let's say, manifest pressures, although there are subtle pressures inevitably. There are drugs problems among the Amis too today sure. uh, and, and things like that. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you. It appears that people on the left are more questioning of the established wisdom than people on the right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my question comes in the area of morality and the parts of society I'm over here. where I'm over here on the left, <laughs> uh, the parts of society which are okay. areas where there's tremendous value associated with, tremendous controversy associated with the important uh, developments such as social organization, right. but relatively poor quantifiable data as contrasted to physical sciences where there's relatively strong data and relatively small controversy about the essential uh, nature of the science. And I'm wondering, what do you see as a relevant methodology for the social parts of biosoma as against the physical parts? Is it qualitatively different from science and the hard sciences? Oh yeah, no question. No question, because the uh, it, it goes to the core of what uh, I attempted to define as what society, a social organization is. I said it's a semi-definite performance entity. Uh, you are never sure of the performance of a social entity. You are sure of the performance of, uh, of a physical experiment. Uh, it's circumscribed, uh, you have an input and you have a very clear output most of the times. But uh, when you deal with biology and we, we, you deal with sociology or the social, social component, if you like, which is the exasperation of, uh, of many, many individual, individual actions and entities, then you have this question of indefiniteness. So it's much more difficult and I don't think you can expect the same degree of precision as you have in the physical sciences, intrinsically. I don't know whether this answers your question. What, what techniques do you find uh, people are using that are effective in dealing with that kind of an environment? History. Uh, I think history is very important. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, trial and error to the extent that you can and attempt to, uh, to deal indeed, to do what the, what the physical scientist de does uh, successfully because the physical scientist can do it and it's much more difficult for the social science, but I tend to work in a more circumscribed environment in, in which you can study variables in, in a more limited uh, number so that uh, the, you can draw conclusions that are clearer, but uh, it's not an easy way. I think, uh, I think uh, uh, you have to rely more and more, however, on, on the ability to model with more and more powerful machines. That's where the machines come, into, uh, come, come to help you. Uh, where I, I happen to be a consultant to Los Alamos, uh, and uh, I, at this moment they have a machine of about uh, capable of about three billion teraflop, com, com, uh, capable of about forgive me, capable of three teraflop uh, computation and very very large number of uh, computations which they need in order to test uh, uh, the. To, to model the, 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 the reliability of nuclear weapons, because as you know, we cannot test human weapons, uh, nuclear weapons anymore. So uh, they're planning to go to machines of uh, 100 teraflops in the next 20 years. Uh, with those kind of machines, you can conduct more sophisticated experiments, you can conduct more sophisticated simulations. So, in spite of the fact that you're dealing intrinsically with a much more complex problem than the physical problem, you may begin to get some help from the ability to, to develop very sophisticated models. Thank you. Okay. One last question here. Go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, kind of a follow-up almost exactly in the same uh, vein. Uh, you mentioned art as being I forget the exact term, non-performance or unpredictable? In, indefinite performance machine. Indefinite performance machine. <laughs> and, and I agree, although I think historically it's somewhat a recent phenomenon to 
have museums where you sort of frame art and people have all these question marks coming okay. out as they look. Okay. In the old days, you know, you were inspiring devotion with your art, okay. um, talking painting here, or causing people to fear hell. There's some very interesting paintings uh, along those lines. Um, and in today's world, I think we do have what I would call effective or predictable art in advertising and in the film. I don't think these are essentially people who work in academia and therefore perhaps it's not strictly a part of your analysis, but there are people who know they want most people to cry right here and they script it and right. it works. Right. And when you want people to go to war and run into machine guns like that, you really need to be sure you understand their psychology and get them to do it with the correct propaganda and so forth. And this is a very highly evolved art. Uh, and I'm thinking it's people who understand how to use the machine uh, with the grain of our biology who have the most power to either promote war or promote some more positive um, Outcome. So I was just wondering if you acknowledge the role of effective, predictable art it is very key to our ability to use science wisely. So you would like to be able to do so, to have to have the ability to motivate people in the right direction. Yeah, you know, I say you're we, really making my point. Right. I, I'm just saying we do have people who know how to do that and very effectively, and I don't think we should forget that. Correct. The question is really whether we use that ability constructively or negatively. And that's the fundamental question, again, at the apex of one of my triangles. Uh, we can do it, should we do it? Because you can use the art in a negative way, in the same way they can use the machine in a negative way, or you can use the machine in a very positive way. Same way we can use the biological organs. You know, this hand can be used to construct things or can be used to strike. And, and hopefully, the more we understand uh, really it is uh, what I called really it is more than global village, the, the more we're able to develop this global intelligence where we understand how an action in one place affects the rest of the world in other ways, uh, we should be able really to use uh, definite performance art in this case of machines uh, in a very positive way. But I concur with your analysis completely. Before we end, I have one last question for you. That is, um, so my wife and I got a cat about two years ago, and we named it Sagan after my Cal favorite Sagan. scientist at the time, right? And had some problems with the cat, so now it's at a friend's house. But we're going to get a new cat. And uh, if I were going to name it after a famous engineer, who would you suggest? That's, uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> I, I got to think. Do you know, a, a famous unknown engineer, I mentioned this sequence. We started with materials. Presumably in your lifetime, you have a sequence of cats. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> let's, uh, let, let's be systematic. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned this evolution of the biosoma, if you like, from the, a material-oriented society to an energy-oriented society to, a, to an information-oriented society. Let's go to the material-oriented society. The pharaohs the, of the earlier dynasty, dynasties who built the pyramids, they were fantastic engineers. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, there was a particular one, uh, now his name escapes me, is, uh, the, the builder of the step uh, pyramid, maybe my wife knows the name. Imhotep. Imhotep, correct. So that was a great engineer. And I would, <laughs> thank you so very much. <laughs> and so I would call your cat Imhotep. Okay. <laughs> and, and there is, <laughs> And there is, a, there is a further reason, of course, because cats came from Egypt originally. That's right. So, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a hand for George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.